Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Anderson. I'm a mortgage loan officer with Guild Mortgage, and I've been a mortgage loan officer since 2005. What I'd like to do in today's video is take almost 20 years of experience working with first time home buyers and give you really good, useful information to think about, to integrate into your exploration process as you're thinking about buying your first home. The first thing we want to cover is, I think, the most critical question Should you buy a home at all? Number two, it is not my experience that the average first time home buyer or even average buyer at all just has a pile of money where they can stroke a check and buy the house outright. So we need to arm you with some basic information about the mortgage process. I want to give you some tools that will help you kind of figure out your options before you make that call to a loan officer. Next up, you may have heard as a first time buyer that you have access to special programs. Maybe there's down payment assistance closing cost assistance, reduced interest rates. Let's talk through how those programs work and some useful things to know before you dive in. And then finally, uh, this one is probably going to get me into a little bit of trouble, but I think in 2024, with everything that's going on in the real estate world, I think it's important to ask and answer the question, do you need a realtor at all? So the reason that I put this question first in the presentation is really to counter what I see as kind of the dominant narrative that runs through our society. And that dominant narrative says something like, if you find yourself renting right now, well, all the dollars that you are spending on rent, you might as well light that money on fire, throw it out the car window, flush it down the toilet, pick your metaphor, you're throwing your money away. And I think that this is really stupid. Um, I don't think it is a useful frame of mind to go into the process of buying a home one thing I've noticed though, over the years, there are a lot of prospective first-time home buyers that call me and I'll tell you, they're not ready. They're not ready financially. They're not ready practically. Um, they are not a good fit for homeownership right now at their particular time in life with everything that's going on with them. I think that it's very, very important that we walk through the financial considerations involved and some practical considerations involved that to me, make homeownership versus renting, not good versus bad, but a more nuanced analysis to determine whether or not buying a home is actually right for you. On the financial consideration side, the most important place to start here is to figure out, do the numbers even work? And to figure this out, we're going to start with probably the most important exercise I can have any of my clients go through. And that is you making a determination when looking at your budget, what can you comfortably afford for a mortgage payment? Now, the mortgage payment you might want to know includes the loan payment itself. And we talk about that in terms of principal and interest. You've got property taxes. You've got homeowner's insurance. You might have private mortgage insurance, for instance, if you're putting less than 20% down. And then you may also have an HOA fee of some kind. If you're buying into a condo, there's going to be a monthly fee for the condo association. If you're buying into a neighborhood, they could be a neighborhood association with maybe shared amenities. There could be an HOA fee. Regardless of those details, what I want you to do is look at your budget and figure out what monthly payment can you actually afford. And I want you to do this before you even consider price points, price range. Look at your budget, let the numbers do the talking, and figure out what monthly payment is comfortable for you. Once we have that number, we're going to factor in the down payment that you have. And on the down payment side, you know, I always tell my clients this, there's no such thing as a wrong answer to this question. If your answer right now at this very moment is that you don't have anything to put down, it's not necessarily wrong, maybe not ideal, but it's not necessarily wrong. Whatever the number is, let's factor that into this analysis. Once we have the monthly payment, the down payment that you're working with, I can help you to determine a home price that actually makes sense. You can run various calculator tools online to do some of your own number crunching. But the bottom line here, just to illustrate, and these numbers are essentially, I wouldn't say made up, but they're not intended to be a quote. This is just to illustrate the concept. Let's say you got $2,000 a month that you're comfortable with on the monthly payment side. Let's say you got $20,000 to play with for a comfortable down payment. That might work out to a price point of about $250,000. Now, again, the exact numbers here are not super important. What is important is that once you've gone through this exercise and determine the home price that actually matches with what the monthly payment constraint that you have is, 
you can take that number, whether it's 250, 350, 850, 50, take that number, load up your favorite real estate search website, look in the areas that you want to look in, take that price point. Are there homes in that area that are suitable, that are desirable for you? If not, then it's probably back to the drawing board. You might need to get into a situation where you have more money to put down. You might need to get into a situation where you make more income. But if you cannot find a home that is suitable at the price point that you want for to get the home that you need, it's at least time to maybe go back and look at your rental options by comparison as well. So once we walk through this process, there are some other financial considerations involved. Now, what everybody talks about and the reason that everybody says that owning a home is like the, the best thing that you can do financially, uh, you'll, you'll see people say that it's the you know, most common or the only way for the kind of common person to you know, put a hand on the economic ladder and build equity. Well, equity, which by the way, to define equity, that is simply the amount of money that you essentially have locked up in the home. So you owe 100000 on the home, it's worth $150,000, you have got $50,000 worth of equity. But what you really have to weigh this equity against, and, and by the way, I certainly don't want it to sound like I'm not a fan of equity. I get it. It's a great thing. And it is one of the best parts of owning a home is that you can build that value over time. But that equity gets all of the press, let's say. And not many people give fair consideration to the cost side of the equation. You know, one thing that drives me completely up the wall is when I see an advertisement from a mortgage person or a real estate person that says something to the effect of, you know, own for cheaper than rent. Um, in my professional and in my personal experience, I got to tell you, if your motive to buy is to save money, I I'd recommend another way. <laughs> because in my experience, owning a home, not only are there costs that you just have to take care of, you know, the hot water heater is going out. Uh, I had one time in the middle of December, a house that I just moved into, the furnace went out. Well, that's a must. <laughs> that is a cost. Uh, that's a cost that you have to bear. But in addition to all those necessary things that you have to fix or repair or improve, uh, there are going to be a number of things that whether you or your wife or partner or spouse or whatever, um, there's going to be a desire to do things to the home, to spend money on the home, to improve the home, make it the way that you want. And those costs, both the needs and the wants, they add up. I'm here to tell you that. And when we compare those costs against the equity, um, it's just an important thing to think about. The equity doesn't come for free. There's a lot of money that you're going to be putting in, not only in terms of your monthly payment, but also money out of your pocket to the repair guy, to the furnace company, uh, to the designer, the decorator, et cetera. There's a lot on the cost side that you really need to think through. All right, now on to the more practical considerations. On the rental side, one thing I want you to think about as a pro, big pro, is the flexibility that's associated with it. The great thing about a rental is that you're making a very defined agreement. It starts here, it ends here, you pay X, that's it. It gives you the flexibility to not make a multi-year commitment in most cases. And there's a value in that, depending on what your circumstances or what you're looking for. On the ownership side, uh, you don't have that flexibility. You're making a long-term commitment. It's a big commitment. But with that commitment comes stability. There are a lot of people that just get tired of renting. Set all the financial stuff aside. Dollars and cents don't necessarily drive all of our decisions. When you own a home, you have the stability of knowing that is where you're going to go home every single night until you decide to sell or move on. That is a good pro to consider. But it's not the case that the flexibility of renting is better than the stability of ownership. These are things that you have to think about and apply to your own life and come to a conclusion about what makes the most sense for you. Another thing to think of on the rental side, uh, I've put this under the broad category of security. You have the security to know that if your furnace does go out in December, guess what? It's not your responsibility. You have the general security to know that the overall maintenance of the property is someone else's responsibility. And I think that comes with peace of mind. Uh, you know, obviously there's the odd case where you've got a terrible landlord and you heard everybody's stories about battling over fixing the blinds or the back door, or whatever the case might be. But in my mind, in general, and in my experience, the security that comes with knowing uh, there is not a $10,000 expense around the next bend for me in my life at the times I've rented, I like that security. Now, on the ownership side, 
um, you are not protected against those costs like we've talked about. And in fact, you have a great level of responsibility. Now, again, this is not a good or a bad. The responsibility, I think, is worth it because you get the stability, you get the pride of ownership, but there are a number of things that you have to do as an owner that you simply don't even need to think about on the rental side. Next up, let's give you a good high level understanding of the mortgage process. I think that it is very important to reduce maybe some of the intimidation factor that might come when it is time to call a lender, which by the way, you should call me. But uh, in either case, let's walk you through some things to think about here. Um, qualifying for a mortgage is a game and it is a game that you can win. Now, why do I describe it as a game? Well, there's a rule book for it. I can pull up, you can pull up the Fannie Mae underwriting manual. I'll put the link in the description. Freddie Mac underwriting manual, the FHA underwriting manual, the VA underwriting manual. There's a rule book out there that tells you what the rules are to win, to be approved for that loan. The first thing I need you to think about is I want you to abandon any notion that you have that applying for a mortgage involves some sort of loan committee, listening to your story, getting this holistic understanding of who you are and what your overall risk is likely to be. Uh, ever since securitization of the mortgage industry back in the 60s and 70s era, um, mortgages are broken down into objective component parts. And when we're evaluating a mortgage for approval, we look at each one of these components separately, largely, and we need to make sure, okay, on the credit side, do we have what we need? Do we have what we need on the asset side? Do we have what we need on the income side? And finally, the property itself, the collateral for the loan, does the property itself pass muster? So on the credit side, let's walk through scores and what those scores generally mean when it comes time to get approved for a mortgage. If you've got under 500, uh, it's a tough situation. In order to have a score under 500, you probably have some work to do. And I don't want to you know, sugarcoat that. It is what it is. And I've helped a number of people transform you know, a 450 credit score into a 650, 700 credit score. It takes time. It takes commitment. It's not an easy thing to do. But it's very important to know if you're under 500, there is very broadly speaking going to be no mortgage program out there for you, unfortunately. So the first thing to do if you're in this boat is to get serious about the credit, figure it out, put a game plan together, put that into action and win because you can win the game of credit as well, just like you can win the mortgage game. Next up, if you've got a 500 to 539, the door is a little bit open. There might be some options, some combination of other factors that maybe offset that low score. Maybe, maybe, maybe you could get approved for a loan. If you're between 540 and 579, let's say the door is open a little bit more. Not a lot more. It's still going to be difficult to get a mortgage, but the door is that much wider. There, there are going to be a little bit better options for you. If you're 580 to 619, let's call that a, a decent chance of approval. Now, obviously, everything else has to be considered. You're not putting yourself in the best position for approval, but once you hit that 580 mark, you're in a spot where the door is you know, pretty decently open. There's still some work to do to get there. Uh, but it's definitely a good threshold to reach if you're coming, you know, say originally you had a 520. If you've passed that 580 threshold and you're not already talking to a lender about figuring out your approval, I, I would recommend once you hit that 580, it's time to really start having that conversation to see what can be done. 620 to 679. Broadly speaking, you are in the approvable range. 620 and higher. You're meeting the minimum criteria for the vast, vast majority of loan programs that first-time homebuyers are going to be looking at. Not all of them, by the way. There are many programs that require higher credit scores. But once you've reached 620 to 679, you're in good shape. 680 to 719. This is the spot where your loan is probably not going to be denied on the basis of your credit score. You're passing the test for the vast, vast, vast majority of loans once you reach that 680 mark. Again, not all. I don't want the compliance people coming down my throat. Um, you know, every loan is evaluated individually. It's hard to speak broadly, but 680 to 719, you're in a good spot, um, but you're going to pay slightly more on the interest rate. You're going to pay slightly more uh, in terms of private mortgage insurance if that's part of your payments. Um, you're not in the ideal range to get the best absolute terms. 
720 to 759, you're almost there into that best category. Uh, you're very good in terms of the loan programs that are going to be available. I do know of a couple programs where 720 is actually the starting point for approval on that. Particularly if you're in the jumbo loan space, you're buying a big old expensive house, uh, 720 is a good threshold to reach on that side. Um, but you're still not quite in the absolute best category for determining your interest rate and the overall cost of your loan. Once you reach 760 or higher, uh, there's really not much of a functional difference. If you have an 820 or a 761, you're, you've kind of reached that great threshold. If you're 760 or higher, you're really in phenomenal shape. Now, it's very important to say this, that the score is not the only thing that matters. The score is where we're going to be lining up your loan on various you know, charts, underwriting guidelines. Okay, we need a score of 700 for this. We need a score of 640 for this. Um, the content of the report also matters a lot. Derogatory events that could show up like judgments, bankruptcies. Um, believe it or not, you could be a year out of a bankruptcy and have a 700 credit score. But because that bankruptcy is on there, that's something that trips a lot of triggers on mortgage guidelines. There's going to be waiting periods associated with that before you can be approved for a loan. Next up, I want to address the issue of credit scores and how to get them, where to get them. If you've got a credit score on your uh, American Express card statement, your credit card statement from your bank, if you're paying for a credit monitoring service, it's very important to understand that not all scores are created equally. And a lot of the scores that are marketed toward consumers are scores that compared to the scores we pull, most of the time they're inflated. And this leads to a lot of disappointing conversations. Somebody will call me and say, well, you know, my credit card statement says I'm at 720. I pull the score on my end, we got a 685. It's a different loan, different interest rate, and it's a lot of implications there. So if you want to get your mortgage credit score, uh, by the way, this is not like a paid sponsorship of any kind. This is one example of a company that I know will sell you the actual mortgage credit score, and that is uh, my FICO. Check it out. You can get an independent um, credit score there that is an accurate score. On the asset side, the basic test here, it's pretty simple. We're going to look at your bank statements. We're going to look at your asset statements. We're going to figure out how much money you have. Where is the money that you have? We're going to look at it and really just the first pass here is, does this person have enough money to cover the down payment that they're looking to take on? Uh, the closing costs that are associated with the loan, uh, and possibly some programs will require that you demonstrate that you've got additional money set aside for what we call reserves. This is the basic test. Does this person have enough money to qualify? Can we document that these funds have been in place for at least two months based on the bank records? We're going to take a look at your last 60 days of history. Is there any money in that 60-day window that's come in from a third party? This is something that we're going to need to look at. The mortgage rules require us to not just look at your bank balance and say, yep, we're good. We're going to look at the content of the bank statement. We're not judging you by how often you go to Taco Bell, but we're going to look at that statement and we're going to look for large deposits because we are required to source where that money came from. You know, the money is going to be used in a real estate transaction. Real estate is like a fraud magnet. And so there are a lot of rules in place that basically put us as maybe a, a first line of defense against fraud and chicanery of various kinds. Uh, we need to make sure we know where the money is coming from for the real estate transaction. So if there is money coming from a third party, if it's a gift from family, for instance, that's something that we have a process where we can document that appropriately under the guidelines. We have people sign a gift letter. We can show, yep, that $10,000 came from mom and dad. We've got a gift letter where they're saying they're not expecting the money back. Uh, we have adequately documented that, but we'll need to look at it. The funds that you get in terms of these large deposits, we have to make sure they come from acceptable sources. So in the case of a gift from mom and dad, that would generally fit the criteria of an acceptable source. If it's your buddy Bob that just gave you $10,000 of actual physical cash, I'm going to tell you right now that is not an acceptable source of funds because we can't source where it came from. Next up, on the income side, the first thing that we need to understand is that there is a difference between how you think about the money that you make and the money that we're going to give you credit for on the mortgage application. This is referred to as determining your qualified income. Um, now, if you're a salaried person, 
that's a very straightforward income calculation. The practical income that you would talk about, you know, I've got a salary of $80,000 a year. That's going to be the qualified income in, in the vast, vast majority of cases. It's a simple, simple calculation there. It's very straightforward. However, if your income is less straightforward than a yearly salary, let's say you have overtime, tips, commission, bonus. Once you start getting into those things, there are very particular rules that require the underwriter to maybe average that income over time, maybe validate that you have received that income for long enough to have established kind of a track record of that type of income. But it is the case that whatever your income is, it's going to go through a filter to determine how much of that income we can actually use on the file. Once we have that income, we can perform one of the most critical, important tasks involved in reviewing a loan, which is determining your overall debt to income ratio. Now, I've got a whole video. It's an older video, but it's actually my best performing video of all time uh, where I walk people through the debt to income ratio in a lot of detail. I'm going to give you the short version for now. The way to calculate DTI is you start with the monthly debts that appear on the credit report and maybe also some other items that don't like child support, things of that nature. You're going to add up the total monthly debts that you have. We are going to then add in the mortgage payment that you're looking to be approved for. So if we go back to our original, you know, should you buy a house example, that monthly payment comfort range, in this case, just for illustration, let's say it's $2,000 a month. We add those things up and then we divide it into your income. So in this case, if you have 750 in monthly debts, $2,000 in debts, we divide that into your monthly income of 7,600 and that equals a debt to income ratio of 36%. Now, if you're running it on your calculator, you're going to see 0.36. Just do the conversion to a percentage there to get that. If your debt to income comes in at 57.1% or higher, there are really just no options I can think of outside of some very, very niche programs. If you're between a debt ratio of 50 to 57%, you might want to consider FHA or VA if you're a qualified uh, veteran or uh, otherwise qualified for a VA loan. 45.1 to 49.9. We're going to go back to FHA and VA is, is good options to look at, but it is possible, even at this high debt ratio range, that you might be approved for a conventional loan. On the USDA side, if you're looking at rural property, you might be able to get approved up to 46%. If you're between 38 and 45, you've got a lot of options on the table. FHA, VA, conventional, maybe USDA, maybe jumbo. USDA and jumbo, and really all of these programs, depending on your individual characteristics, uh, you might not be approved for the ranges that we're talking about, but I'm just trying to speak generally here. If you're under 38%, in my experience, pretty much all the loan programs are going to be on the table for you. So let's put all these pieces together and figure out how you can actually win this game. You've got credit worked out. We know what your credit score is. We know what your report looks like. We have your asset information. We validated the source of large deposits. We've calculated your income. We've determined your debt to income ratio. What we're going to do is we're going to take all that information. And on my end, I'm going to put it into a system called an automated underwriting system. And no, it is not run on a Packer Bell computer from the early 90s, but I just kind of like the image. We put it into the automated underwriting system. And out the other side comes, hopefully, an approval. It might not be an approval. And if there's not an approval, there will be more work to do, more conversations to have. There might be various ways that you can kind of uh, adjust things, like maybe take a couple months to work on your credit, then rerun the automated underwriting system again. Maybe you need more assets. Maybe your overall debt to income ratio is a little bit out of whack and the automated system doesn't like it. Um, the importance of this system is that it is what all of the main mortgage programs rely on, whether you're looking at a conventional loan or a government loan like FHA, VA, uh, USDA, there's going to be an automated underwriting system that looks at all those different parts of your application puzzle and just determines whether or not you're approved. All right, so I'm hoping that that gave you a, a really good kind of base of understanding for how the mortgage process works. Now let's get into some fun stuff. Uh, as a first-time home buyer, these special programs. I've put up the Joker card here because it's going to be extremely difficult for me to tell you anything really super specific in this section because so many of these programs are dependent on the state that you reside in, the state that you're purchasing the real estate in. But here's some basic things I can, I can kind of tell you about on these programs. These programs are location-based, could be based on your state, could be based on your city, your county. It's going to be dependent on where you are. 
the definition of first time home buyer may be different between the various programs that are out there. One common definition, believe it or not, it's not um, it's not maybe a problem that you owned a home five years ago and sold it five years ago. A lot of the guidelines simply require that you have not owned a primary residence dwelling within the last three years. Income limits. The vast, vast majority of these programs are based on a limitation where the folks behind the programs, maybe to get them passed through the legislative process, if it's government assistance oriented or wherever it comes from, there's going to be an income limitation. They want to make sure that the assistance is going to people that quote unquote need it and there's necessarily going to be a line drawn in the sand somewhere. Is that $80,000 a year, $100,000 a year, $60,000 a year? Can't possibly tell you without diving into the specifics of the programs available in your exact area, but it is important to be mindful of the fact that these programs are typically going to be income limited. Next up, some of the programs will require you to go through some home buyer training. Um, now, a lot of people are not looking forward to this, but I got to tell you this. The quality of the content out there for these mandatory home buyer education courses associated with a lot of these programs, the quality of that content today versus 10 years ago, um, let's just say it's night and day. I used to have to beg people, go sit in this random classroom as part of this nonprofit. You got to show up once a week for six weeks and then you get your certificate. Um, the quality of the information was sometimes hit or miss. Um, it was very hard for me to tell people what they were actually in for. Uh, in that kind of older model. These days, the programs are largely online. They're largely self-directed. Um, and I've taken a lot of the courses myself just because I was very curious. I got to tell you, it efficiently presents information that the average first-time home buyer really should know. Um, I'm obviously here to teach you what I can, but going through the education requirements, if it's required to get one of these programs, I think is actually really important. There are a number of of potential restrictions that could prevent you, even if you're a first-time home buyer, from accessing these programs. And so big picture here, I've mentioned like 47 times that these programs are based on where you live and I can't really tell you anything specific. Um, it is important if you are in a position where let's say you need first-time home buyer assistance, maybe you need that assistance to cover your down payment, you've got no other option. It is important as soon as possible to find a lender in your area that works in your area and make sure that they just walk you through any potential restrictions of those programs before you get in too far. Finally, let's end on this fun question. In 2024, to give you some context, uh, there was a lawsuit. Uh, the National Association of Realtors was involved. There was a settlement of that lawsuit, and it's really changed the world of how realtors are paid. Now, I'm probably going to shoot another video sharing some more uh, nuanced thoughts on that. But suffice to say, a lot of people are talking about the role of the buyer's realtor. Is this somebody that you really need on your side? My answer is no. You absolutely do not need a realtor in 2024. But let me walk you through what is involved in a DIY house purchase. Number one, searching. Well, for a long time now, we have been able to get really, really good search for active real estate listings through any number of websites. Take your pick. The real estate profession historically, in my opinion, really built itself on an information monopoly. You wanted to buy a house? In order to figure out even what's for sale, you got to drive over to the real estate office. They're going to open their book of listings and you need to engage the services of that person to even get on the board. Since the advent of the internet and the various sites that are out there, that's absolutely something you do not need a realtor for. Negotiating, particularly negotiating the terms of your initial contract. Is that something that you can do yourself? Absolutely. The contract, um, in most states, there's not like a requirement that you have to use a specific form, but at the very least, you can do some searching around. You can find maybe a template that's used in your area, in your market, download that, fill the thing out, uh, call an attorney if you need some some legal representation here, but working through the contract is absolutely something that you can do on your own. Inspection. Now, this is something I wouldn't necessarily recommend you actually doing the home inspection on your own, but finding the right vendor to go inspect the property, absolutely something you do not need a realtor for. Now, based on the results of that inspection, uh, you may want to renegotiate the terms of the contract. 
I had a good realtor buddy of mine that I've known for a very long time sum it up extremely well that the inspection is there to give you an opportunity to go to the seller and say, look, what I would have offered you on that initial contract, had I known that the roof has two years of useful life left in it, it's falling apart, the hot water heater's leaking and there's water intrusion from the southeast corner in the basement, had I known all those things that I know now based on the inspection, I would have given you different terms. So you're going to have to pony up some closing costs for me or reduce the price. That renegotiation, is it something you can do? Absolutely. Finally, the closing, uh, that's just signing papers. Uh, you can show up to the title company or wherever it is that you're doing your closing. You can sign those papers. You don't need a realtor to sit there and check their email while overseeing your closing. You absolutely do not need that person there. Now, reasons that you might want a realtor. All these same reasons. A realtor can assist to make the search process better. They know you've got Zillow but they may have access to off-market listings. They may know things about certain things that you have searched for. They say, oh no, I walked in that property. The pictures must be the best photographer on the planet because when you walk in there, it smells like cat pee and uh, it's a mess. Don't bother. They can help with the search. They can help with the negotiating. They will put the contract together. They will have a whole slew of inspectors that have a proven track record of good, reliable inspectors. They will handle the renegotiation and they will be there at the closing to deal with things that might come up. Um, a lot of times at a closing, I will see a realtor, maybe they are checking their emails as we're signing the papers, but something comes up regarding where the keys are. What's the access code for the garage? Various little things that maybe you don't think about. Uh, maybe transferring utilities is something that you hadn't considered. The realtor, if they're a good realtor, they're going to be there they're going to think through those things. They're going to make sure that through the closing, you've done all the things that you should have done in advance of that. What I want you to think about here is not do you need a realtor, but do you want a realtor? What you get from a realtor is all of the stuff that we just talked about. You get overall an advocate. You get somebody in your corner that is being compensated to represent your interests. And you can also benefit from their network. You know, like I said, with the inspector. They've got a list of inspectors that have proven themselves. Um, you know, not every Tom, Dick, Harry inspector is going to be a great inspector and might not be good for you. Maybe the guy spending the most on Google ads, which is where you find them on your own. Uh, maybe the reason he's spending all that money on Google ads is that he can't generate referrals. Um, the network benefits of a good realtor cannot be overstated. Uh, I have a number of realtors that talk to me about cases where they've been able to refer, you know, specialty contractors for people that uh, you know were getting raked over the coals with the bids that they got. Nope, your realtor, they got a guy. This is all valuable stuff. So what I want you to think about, again, do you need one? No. Do you want one? Let's look at the value and the cost. Value on this side here, all this stuff, the value of it depends on the caliber of the realtor. A bad realtor is going to be a bad advocate. Bad realtor is going to do a bad job searching and probably not going to have access to any off-market listing information. You know, having a bad realtor is probably worse than having no realtor at all. But if you have a really good realtor, all of these aspects of the process are going to be, be made better due to their involvement in your transaction. Now, from a cost standpoint, there's a little bit of a misnomer. You know, this whole lawsuit that happened in 2024... It had to do with realtor compensation and the fact that the listing on a property would contain information telling the buyer's representative in advance how much they were going to be compensated from the seller. One of the results of this settlement is that transparency as far as how much the seller is basically earmarked to pay in commission to your buyer's agent, uh, that is no longer published online. The fact is though, before the lawsuit and after the lawsuit, the cost to you, no matter what a realtor might have told you, the cost to you to have their representation has never been zero dollars. When you have the seller paying the real estate commission, as is the traditional case, and as is still the case in the vast majority of transactions, the seller is at least ponying up some payment toward the buyer's real estate agent. Who cares if the seller is technically on paper paying for it? You're the one buying the house. So if you're buying a house for $200,000 and the seller is paying your realtor, you're, you're the one showing up with all the money. 
<laughs> you're the one showing up paying two hundred thousand dollars. So it's really kind of your money that's going to the seller and then coming back to your realtor. You're paying. You paid before. You're going to pay now. And there may be some instances where some properties you go to look at, uh, your buyer's realtor calls up and they say, we're not paying a dime for real estate commission. Now, talk to your realtor. There may be ways to negotiate seller paid closing costs and things of that nature that can achieve that same kind of net result. But it's very important to understand that their cost has never been zero. What you can expect to, uh, what you can expect to pay, let's say in a worst case scenario where we've got a listing uh, agent that is saying, yep, uh, my seller is not putting a dime into anything, no closing costs, no real estate commission, nothing. You can expect to pay your average uh, good realtor between around two and 3% for their services. And that's a percentage of the purchase price. Now, is that worth it? I can't tell you that. Do you need a realtor? No. Do you want one? Especially for a first time home buyer, probably, probably use a professional benefit from their involvement in your transaction. In all likelihood, you will end up having a better experience overall. I think it's worth it for most people. All right. So there you have it. That is an overview. Now, all of these subjects that we talked about today, from the first question, should you buy a home at all, to how the mortgage process works, et cetera. I'm going to be doing more deep dive videos, drilling down more into those subjects. But this overview is the start of something that I want to be kind of broad-based education out there for anybody considering purchasing their first home. I hope you took something out of this. If you have any questions, please call me, text me anytime. If you're looking to get pre-approved yourself, please call me, text me anytime. Put comments down below. I'll make sure to answer. And please pass this video along to anybody that might find it useful. Thank you so much for watching.